Well, welcome to Big Valley. Welcome now all of you over in the venue. Glad you're with us. Thanks, Pastor Tim, for leading worship over there. And if you're watching online, we're uh, glad you're uh, with us. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 8. Okay, Romans chapter 8. If you're visiting with us, we're in a series where we're going through the book of Romans together. And there isn't a chapter that we will spend more time in than the book of, or chapter 8. We've been in it for a while. We'll be in it for a few more weeks. And so just kind of get your finger there. If you don't own a Bible, maybe you're visiting with us. All you have to do is go into the altar room. There's one over there in the venue, and we'll give you a Bible. It's important you have the book when you uh, come to church. It's important that you have the book when you're going to study it, whether it be in a men's Bible study, women's small group, or just at your own, I don't know, kitchen table. You You need the book. That way you can take notes and write things in it. Nothing wrong with having a Bible on your phone, your smartphone. I've got one on mine. And there are times when I can pull it out. I'm somewhere and it's nice to read. But when you're actually involved in really studying the word at a place like this, Bible study, whatever, you need the book so you can write stuff in it and all that. So if you don't have one, you can go into the altar room, as I said, and pick one up. We we give lots of them uh, away. Let me piggyback on something Pastor Scott said and Bobby. Um, You know, there are lots of contexts in which uh, we as God's people pray. Probably the number one way is we pray by ourselves. It could be uh, just our times alone uh, at our kitchen tables, in our bedrooms. It could be at work, uh, our car, but we pray all by ourselves. And then there are these moments when we pray with other people. It could be our spouse our children, could be a good friend, something like that. There are uh, times even like this when one person will come and lead us together in a time of prayer, and that's important. And then once a month, we have this time called the dwelling place where we as a whole church come together and, and pray, and it's important. And those cards that you just turned in are valuable to us. Uh, Last night, uh, we gather about an hour before our gatherings to pray. The first service at 9 a.m., we gather about an hour before and we pray. And I handed out cards to all of the people that are in there. There are a lot of them are worship leaders or leaders in our children's ministries, youth ministries. And so they may not have a chance to get in here and write a prayer request. And so we just had a time on our knees praying. And I asked them to write their request down so we could bring them Wednesday. You see, Wednesday, when we meet, is a chance for you to really engage and pray for uh, your church family. Nobody's gonna call you up here and invite you to pray out loud. You're not gonna have to do that. If you, maybe you're new in the faith, you're, you're nervous about that. But there are gonna be moments when the pastors and the elders and their spouses will be up front here and And if there's something happening in your life and you'd like for one of them to pray for you, lay hands on you, pray for you, they're gonna be here and we do that. It's a part of it. We put things up around the perimeter of the buildings uh, or buildings so you can actually get up and you'll walk and you'll see something or have a scripture attached to it and, and you'll spend some time quietly praying for that or you could pray with your spouse or whatever it might be. And so you'll walk around. And then on, we'll have all these prayer cards on tables And this is a moment where you get your mind off of you and all the stuff that's going on in your life and you say, I'm gonna put the needs of somebody else ahead of my own. And you'll pick up some of these cards and you will begin to pray for somebody else. And so it's really a a great time. And then afterwards, we always have some live music out there and desserts and it's just a great time of, of fellowship. Wednesday nights, the last Wednesday night down here is really becoming quite, quite, a, quite a deal. And, uh, and so we want you to be a part of it. And so if you didn't turn in those prayer requests, you can just put them in uh, at the um, little connect boxes uh, around the, the perimeter of the church. Well, um, one of the things we, we're, we're doing through our Roman series is we have these Not Ashamed videos and uh, where we get to meet somebody in the church, get to hear a little bit about their life, maybe how they came to faith in Christ or how the Lord was helping them through a particular situation. And uh, this week's is really special. So check out the Jumbotrons. I was born here in Modesto, California to parents that uh, came here from Iran. We are in the middle of my business and 
lifelong passion, cars, motorcycles. I was the black sheep of my family that I went after the blue collar trade. I was born to a Muslim family. My father was always pretty religious. I always thought that I was spiritually alive and spiritually fulfilled. At some point in my late teenage years, there was a Quran study at a person's house. They started reading something out of the Quran that really flagged my attention. The topic was marriage and how someone is allowed to have up to four wives. And the moment that I just heard that, I knew that there was something very false, but I did not know what it was. So I asked some questions about it and my questions were met with hostility rather than patience and explanation. So from that age, I was about 18 or 19, I started really detaching myself from the Islamic faith. I had a huge void in my life. I started working at this machine shop in Oakdale, California, and the owner of the machine shop asked me to go out to his garden and help his handyman put up a fence. And there's a rose bush nearby and he just nicks his finger open on a thorn and it's bleeding. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, can I get you, you know, a napkin, some gauze, a band-aid? He just put up his hand and he looks at it and he says, isn't that beautiful? And to think that he gave all of his blood for us. In hindsight, as a believer now, I just have, I get goosebumps every time I think about it. I just have so much respect for the man who uses a bleeding hand as an opportunity to speak about the gospel. So I, I started paying more attention to what is it that he really meant. I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing when I just knew the truth. I was actually in a Bible study class at Big Valley Grace. That particular day, <clears throat> I don't know what made the leader of the class choose the Ravi Zacharias video that he chose. He just made it very clear that so many religions focus on works. Having a relationship with Christ, our Savior. There is no balance beam of good and bad. There was nothing to be anxious about, nothing to be afraid of, nothing to be nervous about, because he took care of it all for me. I started shivering from the inside out. I just had a mixture of feelings. I was felt liberated, felt happy to know who I am, who died for me, and who am I living for? In Islam, you know, they talk about God being merciful. That's really kind of about it. They don't really talk about how God loves us. And let me tell you, I've never felt love this strong in my life. There is no love comparable to Jesus' love. I've had to make the realization that accepting Christ has led me to lose some friends, but I don't care. I've never been more alive. I try to speak to my family regarding Christ's love for us and why we need Him. There are times where the opportunity does arise, and then there's times where it's just a concrete wall. It's difficult to go through it. So I would like to please ask my church family to pray for my mom, my dad, and my sister to get to know the Lord before it is too late. God has definitely given me the opportunity to bear witness to some Christian friends and strengthen their faith and their relationship with the Lord. It's been an honor to be able to be used for such things. Christ died for me, so I will live for Him and just keep all eyes on Him. My name is Yash Arnazi, and I am not ashamed of the gospel. He's a great guy. I'm thankful that there are people that are so immersed in the Word of God, the dominating influence, if I could take you back to last week, the dominating influence in their life is the Scriptures. That he cuts his finger on a thorn and he takes that moment very quickly to share this incredible story of God dying, Jesus dying, and how that was used by God. There are all kinds of opportunities that God gives us to touch people's lives. And I'm thankful for whoever that was. 
who in that moment used a little blood to say, hey man, isn't it unbelievable that he shed his blood for us? Father, thank you, Lord, for Yasher, my he's a great guy. <clears throat> he asked us as church family to pray for his mom and dad and brothers and sisters, and we do that, God. We're just lifting them up to you right now. When I gave my life to you, Lord, there was no, my, my family didn't hate me, my mom didn't hate me, my dad didn't hate me, my sister didn't hate me, nobody hated me. But his background's different than mine. And he's done the right thing. He's asked his church family to pray for his parents and we're doing that. We lift them up to you somehow, some way. God, would you open their eyes to the truth of Jesus Christ, who he is. Give uh, Yashirma opportunities to share with gentleness and respect and honor with his family the truth of, about who you are. Bless our time now, Lord, as we get into your word now, and I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, over the past few weeks, we've been looking at some of the differences between a Christian and a non-Christian, some of the differences between those of us that are believers uh, in Christ and those that would be unbelievers. And Paul in Romans chapter eight kind of lays out a number of things. Number one, Christians have a different mindset than non-Christians. Look at verse five. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what that nature desires, but those who live according in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. And it's kind of an obvious truth that those of us that know Christ, our minds are set on something different than somebody who doesn't know the Lord. Our mindset is on godly things, holy things. Our minds are set on what the Bible says. We might have what we call a biblical worldview of things. That's why we study this and read this and memorize this and preach this. It's because all of us are learning how to have our minds set right here. Somebody who doesn't know the Lord, their mindset isn't here. They can be good people, nice people, good neighbors, moral people but their minds aren't set on what God's word has to say. Number two, Christians have a different relationship with God than non-Christians. Look at verse six. The mind of a sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. Obviously, there would be a difference between somebody who knows the Lord and their relationship with God and somebody who doesn't even believe in God. Once again, that doesn't mean that somebody who doesn't believe in God can't be a good neighbor. Well, I have a number of good neighbors who, who, who don't believe in God. They're moral people. In some cases, they, they live a more moral life than some believers I know, which is crazy if you think about it. Number three, Christians have a different attitude towards God than non-Christians. Look at verse seven of chapter eight. The sinful mind, the unbeliever's mind, is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's laws, nor can it do so. Now, some of you might be sitting out here and you, you aren't a believer. You're not a Christian. Maybe you're over in the venue and you're thinking to yourself, hold on here, pastor. I'm not hostile to, to God. I, I'm here, aren't I? I, I I'm, I'm okay. I, I don't... Figure, you know, I don't consider myself hostile to God, and I understand that because there was a long time in my life where I didn't know the Lord, and I wasn't hostile to God. I never had that thought in my mind. I was okay if you wanted to come to church, if you wanted to read the Bible, if, if you wanted to sing songs and give your money away. I was okay with that. I wasn't hostile to the things of God, at least in my thinking. But the Bible is crystal clear. It doesn't matter what you think. The reality is, if you don't know the Lord, if you're not a Christian, in God's eyes, there is hostility. There's much hostility. And then the fourth thing we looked at, which was the big one, 
And that is this, that Christians have the Holy Spirit living in them and non-Christians don't. Verse nine, you, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ or the Holy Spirit in them, he just doesn't even belong to Christ. This is the big one. This is the big thing that distinguishes a Christian from a non-Christian. Believers have God's Holy Spirit living within them. Unbelievers don't. And when you have the Holy Spirit in you, in other words, you're a, a believer, it comes with a number of wonderful promises. And last week, we began to look at what some of those promises are. In fact, we looked at three of them. Number one, if the Holy Spirit is in you, if you're a true believer, if, um, if that moment when you surrendered your life over to Christ was genuine, that really was a genuine moment where you humbled yourself before God, and there was this God, and my will doesn't matter anymore, but it's your will that matters. God, this is no longer about me, it's about you. I'm no longer the, the CEO of my life. You're gonna be the CEO of, of, of my life. If that was an indeed a genuine moment, if you're a true believer, because the Holy Spirit is in you, you'll get a new body someday and you'll live with Jesus forever in heaven. Look, look, look at verse uh, 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 11 again. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. And I talked a lot about this last week, that there's coming a moment when the Lord will come for his church, the called out ones, all true believers, the bride of Christ. We call it the rapture. And at that moment, you will get a new body. This one doesn't get to go to heaven. This one is filled with sin. Paul said, no good dwells in my flesh. All your flesh is is the headquarters of sin. This is where it lives, right here. All this does, your flesh, is connect you to the physical. Your flesh has not been redeemed and it will never be redeemed. Your spirit has been redeemed, but this doesn't get redeemed. It's, you're gonna die someday, they're gonna put it in a pine box six or eight feet under the ground. It's all that's gonna happen to your flesh. Doesn't get to go to heaven. Sin doesn't get to go to heaven. But you will get a new body someday, a, a, a glorified body, a sinless body. You're gonna get one. If the Holy Spirit lives in you. If you're a true believer. And I talked, as I said, a lot about that last week. Number two, if the Holy Spirit lives in you, if you're a true believer, you'll begin to have new desires in your life. Look at verse 12. Paul goes on and says, therefore, brothers, sisters, because the Holy Spirit lives in you, which means you'll spend your eternity with Jesus in heaven forever, we have an obligation. But it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it. Beloved, one of the ways you'll know that God's Holy Spirit indwells you, one of the ways you'll know that you're a, a true Christian, one of the ways you'll know that your decision to follow Christ was indeed genuine, was your desires will begin to change. Amen. They don't all change overnight like that. But all of a sudden, the things of God will become important to you. You'll enjoy studying the scriptures and reading the scriptures because every time you read the word of God, God's talking to you. He's telling you his will for your life. Every time you open this book up, you're hearing God's voice. Amen. And because the Holy Spirit indwells you, you're gonna be drawn to that. And if you're not drawn to that, if your desires aren't changing, that might be a sign that you heard a really neat message one day and you got a goose bump and you walked forward, but it just wasn't a real decision. It might be that you just felt pressure from your mother, you know, to 
give your life to Christ, get her off your back. You know? and it just wasn't real. Because if the Holy Spirit lives in you, you, you you're going to have new desires. The things of God are going to become far more important than whatever those sinful things are you used to chase after when you were lost. And number three, and this was the, the, the last thing that we looked at last weekend, is if the Holy Spirit is in you, if you're a true believer, you'll begin to submit to a new leader in your life, is the way I worded it. Verse 14 says, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Beloved, when the Holy Spirit indwells a person, indwells you, he becomes your leader. Every true believer wants the Holy Spirit to lead them through life. Now, how exactly does that happen? How does the Holy Spirit lead us? Well, he leads us primarily through his word, and I talked about that last weekend. King David said it best in Psalms chapter 119. He said, it's your word that leads me. It's your word that guides my feet. It's your word that's the light un, unto my path. It's, it's this. God, David nails it. Yes, the Holy Spirit was active in David's life when he wrote this, but he's telling us something here that's very important. He's saying, hey, listen, it's the word that's guiding me and leading me. And then I, then I love what he says in verse uh, 106. He said, I've promised it once and I'll promise it again. I will obey your righteous regulations. And that's not a bad promise to make over and over again, is it, Christian? Amen. You know, I mean, we all love the word, don't we? Yeah, I'm gonna live by this thing. It's gonna be the light into my path. It's gonna be the thing that guides me. But the reality is, this side of glory, sometimes our flesh gets in the way, doesn't it? And before you know it, something else is guiding us, something else is leading, it, leading us. And so it's not a bad idea every now and then to come back around and say, God, okay, I, I, I promise again, God, I'm gonna let the word be my guide. I'm gonna let this thing be the thing that leads me through life. So the Holy Spirit leads you primarily through the word of God. Can the Holy Spirit lead us other ways? Yes, he can. Obviously he can. I would never limit what God can do through his Holy Spirit. But this is the primary way that God leads us. I was thinking back to how the great apostle Paul was saved. Some of you remember the story. He's on his way to Damascus. He's riding on a horse. And the Holy Spirit, boom, knocks him off the horse and and, and the Holy Spirit just saved him right then and there. There was no human being there sharing the, you know, the four spiritual laws or the five bunny hops to Christ or whatever the booklet was. Uh, nobody. It was just, God just did it. The Holy Spirit just came upon him and did it. That's what the Word of God says. Could God do that all the time? Yeah. But when you read the Scriptures... When you read the New Testament and you look at the totality of what the Word of God says, Jesus says to his guys at the end of Matthew, I want you guys to go and make disciples. He sends the disciples out two by two. In other words, the totality of Scripture is this. Yes, the Holy Spirit can do whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do. He's God. But the totality of Scripture is he's going to use you. You're going to be his mouthpiece. God's going to use a guy with a blood coming out of his finger to share the good news. God's going to send, the, you know, send someone in your life to share with you the scriptures. He's at a Bible study, and he's listening to the word be, being preached through Ravi Zacharias. That's how you see God at work. And when you look at the totality of Scripture, the primary way that God leads us is through His Word. That's the primary way He leads us. So, uh, today I want to look at three other things that I get, didn't get a chance to look at last week, okay? And uh, let's, so let's read our text. Look at verse 15. 
For you did not receive a spirit, small s, that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, capital S. And by him, by the spirit of God, we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we really are children of God. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. We'll stop right there, okay? I'm gonna give you three more things. And these are gonna be super encouraging. You're gonna have a great afternoon. You're gonna have a great week if you let these thoughts just rattle around in your brain. So in these three verses, we see three more great promises for those of us that have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, okay? Number four, or the first one I'm gonna talk about today, if the Holy Spirit is in you, if you are indeed a true believer, you have a brand new relationship with God. Look at verse 15 again. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him, because the Holy Spirit is in you, we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Beloved, when you received Jesus Christ as your Savior, God established a brand new relationship with you, a relationship not built on fear, but one that was built on sonship. When the Holy Spirit came into your life, you became a part of God's family. And God's family is a family of love. Listen, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't have to worry about the wrath of God that's coming. You don't have to fear the wrath of God that's coming, and it is coming. But if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you don't have to fear that moment. I don't fear that moment. I don't dread that moment. I don't cower when I think about that moment. Why? Because I have the Holy Spirit in me. And at the moment the Holy Spirit came into my life, I was transferred from this, the wrath of God that was hanging over my head into his family. I was adopted into his family. And his family is a, a family of love. I want you to look at that phrase, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. You see that in your Bibles there? The word Abba is an informal Aramaic term that simply means father or daddy. It means papa. And it carries with it the, the, the sense of tenderness and intimacy. It's the most intimate term you can use and that's the way God wants you to relate to him. At the moment of salvation, you were adopted as a son or a, a daughter into God's family. You're no longer a, a slave to your old sinful nature, so you don't have to live in fear of God's judgment anymore. God wants you to see him as one of his children. You're, you're one of his sons. You're one of his daughters. And God had Paul write this. God, God wants you to see him as your dad, as your father, as your papa, this, this intimate term. Ephesians chapter two says this, in him, in Christ Jesus, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Why? Because you're one of his kids. You're, you're his son. You're his daughter. Now, I know for some of you, this is a really tough concept to grasp because you could never think of approaching your earthly father with freedom and confidence, right? So the idea that you and your heavenly father would have an intimate relationship is, frankly, beyond your comprehension. Now, if this is you, you need to understand something. Because of sin, there's no such thing as a perfect dad. Some dads were more evil than others. Trust me, I've dealt with a lot of people. And I, I, I've heard stories, met with some dads that were just evil. 
I realize that some dads are really evil and some aren't. But the reality is nobody's dad in here was perfect. They can't be because they've been impacted by sin. Even those of you that would say, oh man, my dad was perfect. No, they weren't. They can't be. And Paul makes that crystal clear in Romans chapter three, where he says, for all have sinned. For all dads have sinned. Every dad has fallen short of God's glorious standard. So the first thing I want you to understand in here is this, is that wherever your dad was on the evil scale, evil, pretty good. They still weren't perfect. They couldn't be. And I understand some of you had some really evil dads. I get it. I couldn't imagine what it must have been like to live inside your homes. Over the years, I've compiled a, a list of different types of earthly fathers there are, and my intention in sharing these isn't to hurt your feelings. But it's probably gonna happen. And I want you to embrace it. And I'll talk about it here in a moment, okay? There's the, the distant father. He was home, but you just couldn't get to him. And so now you have given your life to Christ, right? And it's easy for you and your immaturity to think, well, you know, probably the heavenly father's like, like my earthly father. I, I just can't get to him. Yeah, pastor, I hear you talking about praying in the dwelling place, but here's the, I, I, I couldn't get to my dad. I mean, he wasn't evil. He wasn't beating me or anything like that, but he's just, he's just, He's just distant. And that's the way you kind of can think of your heavenly father. There's the passive father, he was home, but you know, he really never got involved in your life and many of you think that's God. You believe in him and you love him and you love being in the church and all that, but frankly, you know what, he, he's just passive. He's there, but he's not really engaged in our lives all that much. There's the preoccupied father, you know, he was home, but he rarely gave you any attention because there was always something else going on in his life. And you can think God's like that, the father's like that. Yeah, he's real, but man, he's got other things going on, right? I mean, he's got the whole Iran thing going down. He's got all that stuff happening in Jerusalem and North Korea. I mean, he, he's kind of got other things happening. There's the weak father, not physically weak. He just allowed sin and habits to dominate his life. Mom dominated his life. And you saw it. He could have had big muscles and all that, but a clear liquid in a bottle dominated his life. He was weak. There's the angry father, you know, your goal in life was to simply not make dad mad. I mean, he was a walking time bomb, right? I mean, you'd come home from school and, you know, listen, everything okay? Look at your brothers, sisters, where's dad? And the whole time it was just don't make him mad, just don't make him mad, whatever you do. And so you gave your life to Christ and you can think of your heavenly father that way. That, you know what, man, I just, I just don't want to make him mad. You know, hey, man, last thing I want is, you know, God Almighty to be mad at me. And you think he's just up in heaven just waiting, watching you. Yeah, yo, oh, that's it. And he's ready to thump you. Because that's the way your earthly father was. There's the silent father. All you ever wanted to hear was I love you. Never came out of his mouth. I met a lot of dads like that. Well, Rick, my dad never told me he loved me, and I don't know, I just can't get those words to come out of my mouth. How pathetic of an excuse is that? Amen. 
I kind of had a dad like that. Then didn't say he loved me. In fact, it wasn't until way later on in life that I heard those words. And to be frank with you, when I gave my life to Christ, I kind of took that in. I thought, well, that's kind of like he, him. But as I was reading the word, I kept seeing all these places in there where it said that God loved me. God loved me. God demonstrated his love towards me. And he sent Jesus. He loved, and it was like, whoa, 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 whoa. The word of God helped me understand something different. That's why I'm thankful that Right out of the gate, as a believer, I got into the Word of God so I would know the truth about God. There's the authoritarian or rigid father, you know, it was his way or the highway kind of thing. I mean, you really couldn't discuss anything with him, and so you think, well, I can't really discuss anything with, with, the, with, with the father. Now, it is his way or the highway. <laughs> Once you understand that. <laughs> but he's okay with you coming and talking with him about stuff. I like it when my kids come and say, hey, Dad, I need to ask you a question. Man. I, why are we doing this? I want my kids, they, they, they can have an opinion. And they're free to come to me and, and, res, and in a respectful way question something. I don't mind that. Now, my kids help, can have an opinion. Mom and I have a vote. <laughs> and if my kids can come to me, and sure thing, I was thinking about Remember when the guys were all on the boat out in the Sea of Galilee and Jesus was sleeping and the storm came and the guys got all freaked out, thought they were going to die, you know, drown. And they go wake Jesus up and they say, don't you care? Jesus didn't get up out of the, you know, wake up and go, how dare you? I'm the second person of the Holy Trinity. You know, God's shoulders are big enough for you to go to him and say, God, just don't you care about what's happening? My marriage is falling apart. My kids are gone sideways. My parents are gone sideways. God, I got this lump where I'm not supposed to have a lump and I'm scared. Why, why is it that the hell's angels are as healthy as oxes and they're selling dope to every kid in town and a beautiful Christian woman is dying of cancer, you know? He's okay with that. He, he's not going to change his word. But he's okay with you coming to him and talking with him. Him and I have a lot of conversations. And I come to him in a respectful way. There's the harsh or the tough father, the lying father, I know the selfish father, the perfect father, the unbending father. Here's the deal. Your earthly father may have been a jerk, but your heavenly father isn't. In fact, let me give you a few of the characteristics of your heavenly father that we find in the word of God. He's loving. He's compassionate. He's encouraging. He's caring. He's a great listener. That's something that most earthly dads really aren't that good at. But not our heavenly father. He loves it when you come to him and talk with him in prayer. Loves it. Loves it. You can come talk with him all you want. He, he is a fantastic listener. He's gentle. He's wise, obviously. He's forgiving. He's merciful. He's just. He's totally awesome. <laughs> and he longs for you, Christian, to call him daddy. In other words, because the Holy Spirit is in you, your relationship with him is so different. And many of you don't even understand it. Don't. That God says, call, call, me, call me dad. You're, you're my kids. I've adopted you into my family. We've received a spirit of sonship. We, we've been adopted into his family. The, the moment the Holy Spirit came into your life, you had a new relationship to God. 
And you didn't get that relationship by nature. By nature, you're not a part of God's family. By nature, you're a part of the human family. You're a part of the human race. The only way you get into God's family is by being born into it, by being adopted into it. And I think John best captures what that looks like. John said, he, that's Jesus, came into the very world that he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his very own people, Jesus did, and even they rejected him. But to all who believe him, all who accepted him, all who have humbled themselves before him and surrendered their life over to him, all who have made his will their will, those people, he gave them the right to become children of God. That's how you become a child of God. By simply giving your life over to Christ and at that moment, the Holy Spirit comes into you and you're, this whole new relationship begins with you and, and God. And number, number five, if the Holy Spirit is in you, if you're a true believer, you have a new inner confidence. I want you to look at verse 16. This is just so good. It says, the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit himself, testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. What does that mean? That's really interesting. How does the Holy Spirit within us testify to our own spirit that we really are a part of God's family? See, one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is that he assures us or he gives us the confidence that we really are children of God. Now, that doesn't mean you'll never have any doubts because you will, because you're human. In fact, for those of us that have walked with the Lord for a while, think back to when you first gave your life to Christ. There were probably many times, I know there was in my life, when, and I just didn't know whether I was saved or not, man. And so I would meet with people in the church. I would meet with a pastor. And I would need an assurance of my salvation, is what we, what we used to call it. I, can't, I couldn't count how many people I've had in my office who had a genuine encounter with Christ, and because they were new in the Lord primarily, they needed assurance that they were saved. They needed the confidence that they really were a child of God. What Paul's talking about here in this verse, verse 16, he's not talking about some small mystical voice or you'll hear when, you know, within your soul when you're praying. This is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and I want you to know that you truly are saved. That's not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about something far more concrete Hearing some small voice in your gut, that, that's very subjective. Could have been the Laguini ate last night. I don't, I don't know. Paul has something far more deeper in mind. So, so how exactly will the Holy Spirit within you testify to your spirit that you really are a child of God? Or how exactly does God give you that inner assurance that you really are saved? Well, I want you to listen to what John wrote. He makes it pretty clear. John said this. Remember, the Holy Spirit has filled John. God has filled John. And he pins these words. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know, that you may have the confidence, that you may have the assurance that you have eternal life, that you really are one of God's Children, how how is it gonna happen? How, How is it that I'm assured that I have eternal life, that I'm one of God's children? I have written these things to you. It's in the written word of God. God says to John, John, I want you to write these things because I want people to have the assurance 
that they really are my children. So, so, how does God assure us? It's through the scriptures. The Spirit of God takes the scriptures and he uses the scriptures to encourage my own spirit. In fact, think about it, all of you that have walked with God a long time, I'm looking at Roger down here and Jeff over here and, and we've all had to deal with young believers who needed the assurance of salvation. And we've never said, just trust me. I'm such a great guy, I just want you to believe me when I tell you you're saved. You know what we do? We take people to the scriptures. Do you believe in Jesus? Yeah. Have you accepted him into your life? Uh -huh. You've surrendered your life over to him? Uh -huh. Well, the Bible says right here that those who believe, those that have trusted in him, he gave those people the right to become children of God. You see, how we gain the assurance is through the scriptures. It's this. Everything just keeps coming right back to this. I know I'm saved because the scriptures tell me I'm saved. Now, Jeff and Roger, we don't, we don't struggle with our, we don't need assurances anymore that we're saved. Why? <laughs> We've, we've studied the scriptures for decades. We know. And what happens is the more you study the scriptures, the more you know the scriptures, the spirit of God within you testifies to your own spirit. And it's the spirit who's given you the confidence that you need. That I really am saved. That's why it's so important to get into the scriptures. The more you know the scriptures, the more you study the scriptures, the more you spend time in the scriptures, memorize the scriptures, the more you have a desire to live them out, the Holy Spirit uses that to testify to your spirit that you really are a, a child of God. How many of you have heard that old saying, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. We've all heard that. I saw it on a, on a bumper sticker once. That sounds good, but I want you to know it's really wrong. Here's what it needs to say. God settled, said it, that settles it whether I believe it or not. Amen. Doesn't matter whether you believe it. There's gonna be a lot of things in here, especially early on in the faith, where you may read something and go, wow, that's weird, I, I'm struggling with that. That's okay, struggle with it. But God said it, settled. Whether you get it or not, whether you understand it or not, there's gonna be many things in here you're not gonna understand. There are some things about God you're just never gonna understand. Don't think that when you get to heaven, by the way, you're gonna, oh, I got it all, okay, I got it. There are some things about God we're never gonna know, never gonna understand. That doesn't mean we don't try this side of glory our best to understand those, those things. But Paul, Paul said this in 2 Timothy chapter three. He said, all scripture, that's talking about the Bible, the Old Testament, obviously when this was written, there wasn't a New Testament. He didn't know he was writing the New Testament. So he's obviously talking about primarily the, the Old Testament, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true. It's the scriptures that teach us what is true. And what is, what is true about salvation? If you know Christ, you're saved. God uses the scriptures to teach us what is true. So when you're struggling with, man, is it true? Am I really saved? It's the scriptures God uses to teach you what is true. He uses the scriptures to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It, the scriptures, it corrects us when we're wrong and it teaches us what, you know, what is right. God uses it. He uses the scriptures, not independent of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit within us for many things, for, more than I could preach on in a hundred messages. But it's the scriptures that God uses to prepare and equip his people, those of you that have the Holy Spirit in you, to do every good work, to do whatever it is that God has planned for you. And the, and the last thing, and I, I, gotta, I gotta get to this, okay, I gotta, gotta, gotta do it. 
N -n Number six, if the Holy Spirit is in you, if you really are a true believer, you're an heir of God Almighty. Look at verse 17. Now, if we are children, we're really children of God. If you're his son, if you're his daughter, if the Holy Spirit is in you, then we are heirs. We're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. That's just some crazy stuff right there. My, when my mom passed away years ago, she had, I don't know, about 1,300 square foot house, and there was a bunch of stuff in there, and we had to go through and figure out, you know, there were some heirs to her things. I got some stuff, my sister got some stuff, I don't know. People got stuff, okay? Because we were heirs. 1,300 square feet little house, it took us quite a while to go through it all. It's all God's. <laughs> when you're driving today, just look around. Everything you see is God's. It's all his. And God says, look, because you're one of my kids, remember, I'm dad. I want you to call me dad. Everything I have is yours. You're, you're an heir of all God has. I want you to know something. I don't think the average Christian really gets some of this stuff. You know, we're going to hand out these shoes, and uh, our goal here at Big Valley Grace isn't that every kid has a new pair of shoes and then they die and go to hell. I don't want people to go to hell with new shoes on. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with giving kids shoes. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's a beautiful thing. I think we ought to care like that. But obviously, as Christians, th 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 there's something else that's way more weighty than whether somebody gets a new pair of shoes. And that is we, we care about their salvation, their relationship with God. And so what will happen tomorrow is a whole team will come in here and they'll put the girl's shoes on one side, the boy's shoes on another, and they'll begin to put them in the right sizes and all that kind of stuff. And, and then we take a gospel of John and we put them inside of every pair of shoes. They're taken to the gospel mission where there's kind of like a party thing where they'll be told the story of Jesus and all of that. And, and I just believe that when some little girl, I don't know, gets these pair of shoes and somebody cared about them, we met a felt need that they had. That's just... Just, I think God's going to use that and open their hearts and they're going to pick up that little gospel of John and it'll be the word of God as they read that that God uses maybe to draw that person to themselves. I, I just believe that. And I want you to be praying that too. You see, I, I don't want anybody to perish apart from Christ. I don't want that. I want to do all that I can to be a blessing to the people of my town and while at the same time being a blessing, uh, I, wanna, I wanna tell them about Christ and all the beautiful things that come along with that, like you're an heir of God. God so loves you and cares about you and wants to fill your life with his spirit that you would be one of his heirs. Family, you need to pray that as these shoes are all distributed next week or whatever it might be, however that all goes down, that God uses this act of kindness where we just do what the Bible says and we love others the way we love ourselves and they take the gospels that are in here and the party and God uses that in some powerful ways in, in people's lives. Thank you for helping out in, in, this, in this way. I want you to know it's why Paul prays this. And I, I, I take us back to this thought that we don't get it. Pa Paul said this. Listen to what Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 1. He's praying for the church at Ephesus. And he says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. I think Paul understood that the church just just didn't get it. 
this great hope that we have that someday because the Holy Spirit is in us, we're gonna spend our eternity with Jesus forever with new bodies and glory with him. Don't get it. The church certainly doesn't act that way. Doesn't live that way most of the time. He goes on and, and says, I pray that the riches of his glorious inheritance of the saints, that you would understand that. That there is an inheritance. Your father has an inheritance for you. And then he says, and his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. The Holy Spirit's in you. Hey, Christian, you have nothing to be afraid of in the culture we live in. Nothing. I don't care what comes against you. I don't care how crafty and, and powerful the world is. I don't care whether they've got people in high places, whether it be the president or the vice president or the city council members or the governor of our state. or the. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You have the Holy Spirit in you. He's in you. The power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is in you. And not only do we have this great hope and not only is this a great inheritance, but his power is in you. So don't tell me you can't say I love you to your kids. Don't tell me you can't stand up to a culture that's just dragging us down a rat hole. Oh, no, don't, don't tell me that. You have the Holy Spirit in you. A power that you don't even understand. Frankly, I'm not sure I understand it all either. That's why Paul says, this, this, this is how I'm praying for you. I want you to get the greatness of having the Holy Spirit in our lives. What a great moment that was when Jesus said, hey, listen, guys, I know you don't want me to go, but it's better that I do go, because if I go, I will send the Holy Spirit. Oh, it's a win. It was a win. And may us, the church here at Big Valley Grace, here in Modesto, California, really, really get this really begin to understand what it means to have the Holy Spirit in us. So if the Holy Spirit is in you, if you're a true believer, you'll get a new body and live with Jesus in heaven forever. You'll begin to have a new desires in your life. You'll begin to submit to a new leader in your life. You'll have a brand new relationship with God. You'll have a new inner confidence and you're, you're an heir of God Almighty. Now I want you to know something. If that don't make you have a great afternoon, I, I don't know what, what will. I mean, that's just some good stuff, man. Uh, that's just some good stuff. Why don't you stand, everybody over in the venue, why don't you stand? Father, thank you, Lord, for uh, last night and today. It was just great, Lord. I sure enjoyed the butlers out there singing last night. That was just a beautiful time of fellowship, and that was great. I loved that. Thank you, Lord, for last hour. Just great people. Thank you for this hour, a chance to come and sing and give and hear the word proclaimed and pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. And God, obviously, Lord, I don't worship the Bible. I don't worship it. But without it, I, I can't know the one I'm supposed to worship. And so thank you, Jesus, for this incredible book. May we, your church here at Big Valley Grace, find great joy as we read your word this week. And I pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and all the God's people said, amen. Okay, live for Jesus, okay?